Hello and welcome back to the Lucid Dreaming Podcast. It has been a long while. I know I've disappeared, but a lot has happened in the past year and some. I think the last episode I did was around November of 2016. It's been more than a year. I apologize for my absence, but I have changed jobs. I have moved to a different state. I left LA. I live in Portland now, and it's green and beautiful and cloudy and awesome. But I have been busy, and part of it has to do with lucid dreaming adventures and endeavors, and I wanted to update you a little bit about that. And I also wanted to update, people have been emailing me, and it's been very, very sweet. I've been getting emails from people listening to the podcast asking me how my sleep is. There's been an episode a long time ago where I confessed my poor sleep quality, and I've since been trying everything under the sun to really improve my sleep. And I wanted to actually share some of the ways in which I've I found, I finally found things that have helped and those are there are three main things that really made a difference. But even before that, I basically tried all sorts of supplements, of course, the usual melatonin approach. And I've tried all the health hygiene, you know, best practices, making the room as dark as possible, reducing the temperature. It's um, your body sleeps better in a very cold environment or a colder environment. In fact, I think 65 degrees is most optimal, as cold as that may sound. Um, other things like, you know, turning off screens earlier before going to sleep and so on and so forth. And all of those have made, you know, improved a little bit, but not really anything substantial. Um, and in fact, I wanted to recommend an amazing episode of the Joe Rogan podcast where Matt Walker, um, who is a sleep neuroscientist, um, was on the episode and talking about sleep and how important sleep is and just how every little bit of sleep that you miss or that you don't sleep well, just how detrimental that might be. And I think it's just absolutely a must listen. And I will link to it in the show notes amongst with everything else I'm going to mention here. But what has worked for me, it seems, after a very long time in the past year, I decided to really do the unthinkable and cut down my coffee consumption. I've never drank all that much coffee. It's only I was already down to two cups a day. However, my second cup of the day was in the afternoon around two or three. And I think that my metabolism and my genes probably process caffeine very slowly. And so just reducing my coffee consumption to one cup of coffee a day and only in the morning has really made a difference. And the way I described it is that it seemed to have brought back um, you know, some of the sleep gravity, that feeling of being actually not just tired, but but sleepy, right? I used to wake up in the morning and, you know, that feeling where you have two more hours to sleep and you just feel this gravity pulling you back and you just want to close your eyes and succumb to it and feel that and, and allow yourself to fall back asleep. In fact, I used to say more fun than going to sleep is going back to sleep. That's how much fun it used to be. But when my sleep quality um, went down, that feeling went away and I would wake up and w it would be really hard to fall back asleep and I would wake up multiple times during the night. And so when I reduced my caffeine, a little bit of that sleep gravity came back. And then um, the next thing I tried that seemed to have helped a little bit as well is neurostimulation device. In fact, there's a there's a I think almost the only FDA approved neurostimulation device for it's promoted to to treat both insomnia and depression and anxiety. Um, the original device is called the Fisher Wallace stimulator, but this is basically a version that's not FDA approved that you don't need a prescription to get, but it's identical technically. And they wanted to basically create a version that can be integrated as a consumer device with um, a VR headset as a sort of um, an experience of, of sort of calmness. I think they, they promoted it together with this uh, VR game called Land's End. Um, but you can use the device without uh, any VR 
gear or headset, and you can use it just like the Fisher Wallace stimulator. And it's called Cortex with a K. I'll link to that as well. And that seemed to have helped a little bit as well. But the kicker, the thing that really made the biggest difference, as far as I can tell, you know, maybe as as much as the caffeine reduction or even more so, is CBD oil. I I did not see that one coming, and I've been gr- I've grown skeptical over the years with all sorts of like little you know essential oils and you know supplements and herbs and everything I've tried. I mean, it's just kind of ridiculous. And when a friend introduced me to CBD oil, which basically is um, one of the cannabinoid, I forget how to pronounce it, but one of the components in uh in cannabis that is not thc and is not psychoactive and is practically legal everywhere on its own people use it for anxiety for sleep and for many other things and it's now being more and more heavily studied which is phenomenal and i was i was skeptical because again i've tried everything and once i got a little bit of cbd oil the kind that you just put under your tongue for 30 seconds and that sleep gravity really, really came back. And my sleep is not perfect, but that has made such a big difference that I can feel it when I no longer use it. And I was really surprised. I was uh, I was delighted. Uh, I don't know. I am fascinated by how it works. I'm not completely sure. And um, I think it's one of those things that is worth a try. The company I got mine from, is called Green Earth Medicinals, but I'll I'll put a link in the in the show notes on the website, and you can you can find it and, and take a look. I think they ship everywhere, but I think this is if you're having sleep issues, and of course, your mileage may vary. Different people have different sleep issues. Different things work for different people. Most of the things I was was trying and was recommended to by many people. You know, for them, those things worked, right? But uh, for me, it didn't. And so if you feel like you've tried everything and you haven't tried this before, I think it's I think it's worth giving it a shot. I I think it really for me, it made a a difference that I couldn't believe. And so my sleep, good news, has improved tremendously. And uh, so that's the update on that. And thanks for everybody who kind of checked in on me. Um, I appreciate that. And so the other update that I wanted to give you is about being busy in the lucid dreaming endeavors. Uh, I think some of you know, and I've talked about it a little bit, but not really extensively, is working on the lucid dreaming device, the neurostimulation device based in part on the study that came out in 2014. Developing a hardware device takes longer and is more complicated, of course, than I assumed. And I already assumed it was more complicated than I thought. But uh, it's still in the works. We're still working on it. There's a company name. There's a team. There are two neuroscientists on the team and a couple of engineers. And it's called Paracosm Labs. And the device is going to be called Kensho. I don't want to say too much at the moment, but we're working hard on it and making progress, and as soon as there's something really worth announcing, um, I will, you'll, you'll, you won't miss it. So stay tuned. Okay, for today's guest, oh my God, this is a phenomenal episode, and I talked to Dr. Denham Aspie, who is a lucid dreaming researcher from Australia, and he has done some interesting studies. In fact, when I, when I, it's he is one of those people where um, you'll you come across some of his studies um, if you're even just remotely tuned to lucid dreaming news. Uh, every time he puts out a study, like all the news outlets grab it and, and it seems to show up everywhere. Um, and but I think what was interesting is a lot of those studies originally seemed to me kind of uh, I wasn't I wasn't sure. Uh, they're always interesting, right? But I think reading a scientific study, even when I'm 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 a person that reads a lot of studies uh, for all sorts of scientific areas, but I don't think a lot of it gets conveyed well. Uh, I mean, those are really technically written in a scientific language usually, but even when they're written about and talked about in the news, a lot gets lost and it's not always accurate reporting and there's a lot of misunderstanding and misconceptions and so on. And so talking to Denim was really insightful because I think, and you'll hear me, you'll hear my mind gets blown several times during this episode because there are such incredible little insights and gems. Um, we talk about his studies and 
one of his studies is about the effects of uh, vitamin B6 on dream recall, which is remarkable, um, about combining and stacking methods, about really amazing insights about uh, dream journaling and ways of writing a dream journal that is more less time consuming and actually as effective and more effective in some cases and really get into some of the nitty gritty. I think this one is really worth a listen. And I've, I've learned new things and I've really kind of, it, <laughs> it's not very often that I feel surprised about new information about lucid dreaming and dream recall and things like that. So I think you'll enjoy it as much as I did. So without further ado, I give you Denim Aspie. So today on the podcast, I have Denim Aspie from uh, Australia, from Adelaide, I believe. Mm-hmm. Uh, thank you for coming on the podcast. My pleasure. So you're researching lucid dreaming. Uh, this is the main reason sort of we got connected. I've seen um, some of your studies published and then some articles about it. And I've been wanting to talk to you for a while. And so it's, it's good to finally uh, get you on the podcast. Yeah, definitely. Been a bit of um, a bit of back and forth to try to um, find a time we can both talk. But yeah, it's it's good to finally do this. Yeah, definitely. So uh, just before I get into the actual research and the nitty gritty of uh, what you've been working on, I thought it'd be nice if you can just give a, a quick background of your, you know, yourself and in, in, in your profession in particular, and then maybe a little bit about how you got into lucid dreaming. Yeah, sure. So. I've been doing scientific research on lucid dreaming now for about um, just over four years. And I, I've done that through doing a PhD in psychology at the University of Adelaide. And yeah, it's been quite an amazing experience. Uh, initially, I wasn't even going to do research in this area. I'd organized to do research on an entirely different subject. I was going to look at body language and nonverbal communication for my PhD. But I've always been really interested in lucid dreaming. And the night before my PhD started, I actually had a spontaneous lucid dream, um, which really, really inspired me. And I woke up from that and I thought to myself, wow, I could do research on this instead. Very cool. Did you have uh, any lucid dreams before that? Yeah, I did. So I've been interested in this for a long time. And I spent, um, I had my first lucid dreams when I was a child. I can't even remember um, when the first one was. I was probably very young when that happened. And I've always spent a lot of time trying different techniques uh, to try to have lucid dreams more often. But I always found it really difficult, and I found that the techniques were not as effective as I hoped that they would be. So when I had this lucid dream before my PhD started, um, a few things kind of clicked in my mind, and I, I thought to myself, wow, this is an opportunity where perhaps I could become really knowledgeable about this subject, and not only would I possibly be able to finally learn how to have lucid dreams more reliably myself, I might also be able to help other people do the same thing through doing research on this subject. Yeah, it's interesting because that's kind of been my internal mission in some ways. And I think uh, initially when I started the podcast quite a while while ago, um, I did it as a way to sort of dive into the subject and hopefully by way of doing so, also sort of learning about it and being able to share that information. So it's it's always awesome to hear people who do it at a more professional scientific level. So that's that's great. Yeah, thank you. And unfortunately, there aren't very many of us. Um, there's a few people in uh, around Germany and there's a couple of people in the States, I believe. But, um, but all up, there's not many people that are actually working on this. Um, and we still have a way to go. There's a lot of studies that have been done on lucid dreaming. And there's about I think there's about 40, give or take a few, depending on what you count as a scientific study, because some of them are a little bit, um, they're not published in scientific journals, for example. But there's around 40 studies that have tried to teach people lucid dreaming. Right. Um, and they've looked at a wide variety of techniques and, and whatnot. But unfortunately, most of them have fairly, um, fairly low success rates that aren't really high enough yet for us to start seriously looking at the many potential benefits of lucid dreaming. So we still need more work done on this, but unfortunately, not many people are in this area. Yeah. And I feel like we're barely scratching the surface with, you know, much of this, but I actually wanted to ask you about, you know, doing this, uh, in a scientific, um, area, because I remember very well, you know, all the way back to Stephen LaBerge talking about doing, you know, wanting to do research and talking to other scientists and, uh, Keith Hearn, uh, kind of the same thing and a few others that 
came since then. I had Jane uh, Gockenbach on the podcast, and she was describing just the same stigma about studying lucid dreaming, even after it was sort of scientifically validated as a real thing. Um, so I'm curious if that's still an issue. Um, perhaps to an extent. Um, I haven't really, I mean, I've been uh, interviewed quite a few times now. I've, I've been very fortunate that my work has attracted quite a bit of publicity, which has been very helpful, especially in getting participants to to take part in, this, in the research I do. So I've been interviewed a lot of times now, and I've had a lot of people ask me about lucid dreaming. But fortunately, um, virtually everyone has been, uh, the attitude I get is one of curiosity and open-mindedness, usually. I haven't had people come in and, and try to say things like, oh, but this isn't a valid subject. And, and perhaps that's, uh, hopefully that's because people are realizing that it actually is um, quite well established in the scientific community now. Um, as you said yourself, in, um, in the, the 70s, some people were able to confirm that lucid dreaming is a genuine phenomenon and it is a learnable skill. So... So yeah, it's, um, but there is still, I, I guess the stigma around it is not so much whether or not it's genuine or not, it's whether or not... Um, it's worth pursuing? If it's worth pursuing and if it's realistic that we'll ever be able to teach people how to do it um, reliably enough to look at the applications. Right. And, and you know, I, I'm, I'm curious if, you're, if you mean about the, the feedback from people more within academia or, or outside of it. Yeah, so I guess it's a little different in both of those areas. So outside of it, people often don't really know a lot about the subject. You know, a lot of people have dab dabbled with lucid dreaming or they've heard about it and people have seen movies like Inception and that gets people interested um, <laughs> in this kind of subject. So a lot of people are interested in the general population and when, you know, when especially if, um, you know, if I come in and I say I'm a doctor of psychology and I have a PhD in this, people are generally um, pretty willing to listen and interested in, in what you have to say. Um, in terms of the scientific community, so it's it's similar, I guess, except that um, because there's been those 40 or so studies, give or take a few, and because most of them haven't had very high success rates, I think there's a bit of an implicit assumption that lucid dreaming has been done already and you know scientists have come in they've had a good look at it they weren't very successful and now that subject is over and done with um, and if you look at the the number of publications per decade you notice that there was a surge of research in the um, 70s and the 80s and then there's less in the 90s and less still in the early 2000s and and now we're, we're basically at a record low in terms of the number of studies are looking to teach people how to have lucid dreams. So it's almost as though academics have uh, kind of given up on the subject a little bit, at least in, in that aspect of it. Yeah, yeah, and and again, I think the, um, to me uh, at least the interesting uh, the interesting part that's going to come up once once uh, allowing people or ma making it easier for people to have lucid dreams uh, happens. That's when the interesting part comes in of, of studying this in, interesting, unique state of consciousness and what people can do in it and what the effects on our psychology might be and, and you know, consciousness research and just understanding sleep better and so on and so forth. Uh, and so, you know, I, I have some a personal mission of, of sorts to try to find a technological solution for it and been working on that for a while. But um, even though it might be a little ways away, I love that you people like you are actually, you know, looking at what we have now and what are ways like, for example, to combine systems and methods and validate them and see what works better and so on. Yeah, I think that's really going to be the future in this area, um, because what you see is a lot of these studies that have been done already, they've looked at um, specific techniques. And sadly, most of them haven't looked at these techniques very closely either. So um, a quick example, if uh, people out there are familiar with the um, the mild technique, where you basically repeat the phrase, next time I'm dreaming, I want to remember that I'm dreaming whilst visualizing yourself becoming lucid. You do this during a brief awakening in the middle of the night. Um, and with this technique, you would think that you would want to be looking at variables like how many times has the person repeated the phrase or how motivated are they or how long did they spend on it, how long did it take for them to return to sleep after they finished. But what you find is um, there's, there's quite a few studies that have looked at this technique, but, but pretty much none of them have actually looked at these these kinds of variables, which I was really surprised by when I first got into this area because – if you want to improve the effectiveness of these techniques, surely you need to look at the specifics of how they work and how they're practiced so you can refine them. 
Yeah, and it's, I mean, it's it's kind of funny that that's not the first thing people look at because there's so many variations of, I mean, even if you just look up the technique, you'll get a bunch of variations and explanations of how to, what the technique is and how it's done and how it should be done. And people are say, playing around with, with these kinds of things or mixing between the names. So when, you know, unless you actually give people the particular instructions and you make them very explicit, then it, and that's even without trying to test for you know coming up with variations of a, of a particular technique and testing between those variations, you know people might just do whatever they think the the technique is. So it sounds very open ended if if you don't you don't get to the specifics with it. Yeah, exactly. Um, so a quick example from my own um, research just to highlight the point. So the amount of time taken to return to sleep after doing the mild technique. Um, I found that on average, the success rate was about uh, 17.4% of attempts would lead to a lucid dream. So that's about one in six. Mm. But when, pe- when people were able to do the technique and then fall asleep within five minutes, um, that shot up by about 86% higher. So that, that's a massive increase in the effectiveness. Fascinating. Yeah. What do you make of that? What I make of that and this, what I discuss in my paper about this is um, – the, the mild technique, I mean, it stands for mnemonic induction of lucid dreams. And the word mnemonic, um, you know, relates to memory. Mm-hmm. The way the technique is working is you're supposed to create this intention to remember that you're dreaming next time you're in a dream. So, you know, it makes sense that the, if you can form this intention and make a very strong intention in your mind and then fall asleep quickly, it's more likely that that intention will stay in your mind because the longer, the longer you're awake for, the more it's going to become weaker and you'll forget. Right. So, so it makes a lot of sense that this finding has come up, but no one's ever looked at that before and no one's ever reported it. But now with this knowledge, um, and this is exactly what I've done in my latest study, which isn't published yet, I, bas- I basically changed the instructions a little bit to really focus people's um, attention on the importance of falling asleep again quickly after they do the technique. And so I give people exercises to help them fall asleep more quickly and, and things like that um, in the hopes that it'll make the technique even more effective again. Cool. Can you share a little more about that or you have to wait until it's published before you uh, get into the details? Yeah. So I, the data is, um, so I had, uh, so this is a study I did over the summer. Um, and this is, was during a period where I had a lot of publicity for my research, which, um, as I alluded to before, really helps with getting participants. So um, I managed to get 2,000 people from all over the world, um, wow. all different countries around the world. Um, and I haven't analyzed the data yet because there's just so much of it. But it looks like um, it looks like the success rate is higher again. It looks like I've got a success rate of around 20% of attempts with the um, instructions that I modified from the first study. That is very cool. So I, I I look forward to hearing the the results of this, but I guess for now we can. I would love to run through a few of your uh, published studies and and some of uh, the experiments that show up on your on your website. And by the way, I'll, I'll we can mention it, but I'll, I'll link to all of your all of your stuff in the show notes. But on luciddreamingaustralia.com is is where people can find the research you're doing and and all the information. Yeah, that's right. That's my own, that's my website where I've got all my information and um, also workshops and things like that. I'm actually just rolling out a series of workshops in Australia, which I'm really excited to be doing as well. So, oh, that's awesome. So uh, let me let me ask about. I think you looked into um, vitamin B uh, to try to help uh, prepare for sort of lucid dreaming. Can you tell me a little about that one? Yeah, yeah. So um, this is a study that I uh, conducted a couple of years ago, and it's just been published. It actually got published um, late last week. So, oh, cool. Yeah, so it's just out, which is really exciting. Um, and there's, uh, there's a chance that that might create a little bit of interest in the media again. So we'll see what happens with that. But um, but yeah, fingers crossed. So, so basically that study, um, it follows up on a really small study that was done um, – when was that study done? I think let me double check that. I think it was 2002 by um, the authors Evan et al. in 2002. So it was a very small pilot study, which basically means like a um, a preliminary exploratory study on a small scale. So they had 12 people and they they looked at the effects of having um, different doses of vitamin B6 directly before bed and what that might do to a person's dreaming during the night. 
And in that study, they found evidence that um, people had basically improved the dream recall by, by taking vitamin B6. But that was the only study that's ever been done. So I looked at this and I thought this could potentially be a safe way that people could um, take a supplement that might enhance their dream recall. And that might in turn make it easier to have lucid dreams as well. Right. Yeah, so I followed up on that and I did a, uh, a much larger study with um, 100 people from all over Australia. Nice. Yeah, and um, I randomly allocated them to one of three different groups. And those groups involved either taking um, a high dose of vitamin B6 before bed. And then there was a second group that took um, the same amount of B6, but they also had a range of other B vitamins as well to see if they might all work together mm -hmm. with B6. And then the final group was a placebo condition, and the participants didn't know what they were getting. So that's um, it's called a, a double-blind, um, randomized controlled trial where I didn't know, and the participants didn't know what they were taking. That's great. Yeah, this is um, this is sort of the gold standard in this kind of research because it makes it um, el eliminates the possibility of of bias or people expecting certain effects from what they're taking because they don't know what they're taking until the end. I did this, and I got people to first record um so i got them to record their dream recall for five days and they took the supplement before bed um, on each of those days as well and the findings were, were really exciting so what we found is that with the most sensitive measure of dream recall um, we found that people recalled quite a lot more content from their dreams um, in the b6 condition compared to the to the placebo condition um, i think it was about 60 percent greater and by what by what measure exactly? I'm curious. Like how how do you uh, how do they report their dream recall? Yeah. Okay. So this is um this is an area that I've done um, some research on as well. Um, the the way that we measure dream recall because if you're going to do research in this area, it's really important that you have measurement instruments that are going to be um, precise and accurate and whatnot. Um, and this is one of the problems that you see in this area of dream research. Generally, um, sometimes the measures aren't really the most valid. So um, I included several different measures in the study. Um, so to measure general dream recall, so just any kind of dream, how much you're remembering from your dreams. Um, I looked at dream recall frequency, which is basically, this is just the, the, the percentage of days where you recall something about your dreams. It doesn't matter if you recall a tiny bit or a lot. If you recall anything, then that counts as a hit. If you don't recall anything, that counts as you don't remember anything. Um, so that's the least sensitive measure because it doesn't look at how much you're recalling. It just remember, looks at if you recall something. Um, and there was no difference on that measure. And then there was the next one, which is called dream count, which you basically count the number of dreams that a person can remember. Um, and same thing that there wasn't any difference. Um, there wasn't any significant difference on that. There was a trend towards people recalling more individual dreams per night, but it didn't come up as big enough to really get excited about. Um, okay. And then the third measure is the most sensitive measure. So that's called dream quantity, and that's a measure that I actually developed myself. And what it involves is you you write down um, a short title for each dream you can remember in the morning, and then you actually rate how complete your memory is of that dream. So it might be um, only a fragment, fragmentary recall, it might be partial recall, it might be majority recall, or it might be whole recall, where you, you think you can remember pretty much everything that happened in the dream. And that's the only thing you write down? Um, yeah, so there's the categories are predefined. So um, you, you use a standardized set of categories, there's those four categories, um, and then you write down the rating for each individual dream and you add them up. Um, and then this, this gives you a, a quantity of how much content you can recall from your dreams in the morning. Cool. Very cool. Um, and so with that measure, that one, there was um, quite a big difference in the amount of content that people could recall from their dreams. And uh, I believe it was 64.1% more content if you take B6 compared to placebo. What about the B complex? Um, B complex, um, interestingly, didn't have a significant effect on dream recall. So, oh. yeah, it's that was a bit unexpected because the B vitamins all work together in um, in very complex and synergistic ways. And I expected that adding the other B vitamins would quite possibly enhance the effect, um, but I didn't know for sure. So that's why I just added that in as an experimental condition yeah what i what i think is maybe some of the other b vitamins might have either counteracted um or sort of 
yeah, counteracted or overridden the effect of the B6 because that had the same amount of B6 as well as the other B vitamins. Um, so there's something going on there that, that diminished the effect, I think. Well, that's that's fascinating because, again, if people um, – I mean, it's really cool that you added that because people might say, oh, you know, this study shows that B6 vitamin might help. They'll get some kind of B complex with enough B6 vitamin, but not necessarily knowing that that could counteract. Uh, but because you actually added that to the experiment, that's another data point and something to take into consideration if people want to try this. Um, so that's that's good to know. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, so definitely glad that I added that in there um, because, as you say, otherwise people see that result and then, you know, it might lead them down, um, you know, down the wrong path and, and then they're going to do something that's not actually going to help them. Yeah, and and again, what I love about this uh, particular study is that there's so much, I mean, if you, for people who are into lucid dreaming on, you know, the lucid dreaming subreddit and uh, in other forums, there's always like, oh, I've ate this and I've tried that and I'm, I, you know, consumed this herb and had this tea and it's all very kind of, um, again, one, it's of course subjective. There's a lot of, you know, kind of self placebo administered in some ways. And it's hard, it's really hard to parse out from, you know, reports of people trying different things to enhance memory or to, you know, increase the chances of lucid dreaming. Um, especially with supplements, like what actually works and why it worked, even if a, a particular person, you know, it worked for them. And so doing something like this actually gives you, you know, far more reliable data. So this is, this is really awesome. Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, and we know that expectation effects are, are very powerful in lucid dreaming. You know, just the placebo effects can have a big impact. Mm -hmm. So, you know, someone says, oh, you know, bananas increase lucid dreaming. And if they if they actually think that, then when they have a banana before bed, it may very well <laughs> increase their lucid dreaming rate. But it's not because of the banana. It's because of what they believe about the banana. Um, right, exactly. And that's not going to be very helpful to someone else that doesn't share that belief. Yeah, yeah, and so just to, just to, just so I understand clearly, um, so the B six didn't seem to increase the number of dreams that people report they remember, just more on the side of the how much of the dreams that they do remember they remember. Yeah, that's right. Okay, fascinating. This is so cool. And I think this is um, I think this is going to be the future of lucid dream induction. So um, combining multiple approaches. So I think ultimately. What's well, probably going to be um, the approach that I end up uh, doing more research on, and which I think will be quite successful, is combining an effective um, cognitive technique, which these refer to mental exercises like that mild technique we were talking about before, having a cognitive technique, having some kind of supplement like B6 or some of the other ones like galantamine that have also been looked at, and then having a third, right. and then a third approach, which is also something like external stimulation, um, using technology and, and things like that that you were talking about too. So adding these three different kinds of approaches together might give us a really high success rate, which is enough to then start looking at how we can benefit people with lucid dreaming. Yeah, that's very cool. And I'm a, I'm a big proponent of the same idea. And I think in, a, in one of the posts I wrote a long time ago about basically for beginners, I always, you know, suggest they start with something simple and with something basic, especially with increasing dream recall. So that's why another reason I love the B6 study, um, because it's, you know, dream recall is so fundamental to, to lucid dreaming as far as I'm concerned. But then I say, if you have the time and energy and you want to really put into more into it, you sort of can stack these methods and combine them in a way that, you know, and, and I always encourage people to experiment for themselves as well, because again, not there's no one size fits all, but then seeing you researching, combining those methods um, is also fantastic. So maybe you can tell me about um, that study as well. Um, yeah, so I haven't actually done the research on combining them yet. So the last study I did over the, um, over the summer here in Australia, so that's uh, three or four months ago, um, in that study, I, um, I had a closer look at the, the mild technique and also the reality testing technique to try to see um, if different kinds of reality testing were important or whether you need to do reality testing at all um, and then to try to refine the mild, te mild technique as well. So, so that was still just looking at these cognitive techniques, but um, the next one that I do... That it wasn't one where you were combining the reality testing with mild or something like that? I mean, I know it's sort of different types of techniques, 
but yeah yeah so um so i did that and so i've got my published study called the national australian lucid dream induction study and that came out um about six months ago that was 169 people from across australia and that did combine some techniques but then i did a, a larger international study um just a few months ago and that that had a closer look at the same kinds of techniques that i was already looking at um but tried to refine them and make them more effective and look at some some different combinations that i hadn't looked at yet but it's still in the realm of those um cognitive mental exercise techniques the next thing i'll be doing is right. looking at things like combining the most effective cognitive approach um, which i've now identified i think uh, and then com combining that with uh supplements like b6 or galantamine right um and then once once I see how successful that is, then the next step will be then introducing um, some kind of external stimulation techniques as well. Right. And you also looked at the senses-initiated lucid dreaming method? Yeah, yeah, I did. So um, that's a, I did a follow-up um, study. So when the people of my main study, I then asked them to, um, if they wanted to trial a new technique. And so, so that was the SILE technique. And that's never been studied before in any scientific papers, but I've um, found some evidence that that's also effective. So that's uh, currently under peer review. So hopefully it'll come out and be published sometime in the next three to six months, but we'll have to wait and see with that. Right, right. Very cool. It's quite a difficult process getting scientific papers published. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I, you know, it's 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 long and arduous, but I think it's it's worth the 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 time and investment, and and even on the people who are just curious about it, the the wait uh, to to sort of um, see and find those out, and of course, peer review is a, an important part of the the process. So yeah, absolutely, um, we need this. We need we need more more you know better quality research that's looking at it more carefully. So even though it is arduous, as you say, it's uh, it's it's worthwhile and it's something that I'm willing to do. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, you you there's one mentioning here about dream recall and and keeping a logbook. Can you talk about that? I think it mentioned something about an un underestimated. Uh, by retrospective measures, and I don't think I understood what that meant in this context. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so that that paper, there's actually two papers there. One of them was a review where I um, reviewed the literature and looked at different ways that people are measuring dream recall. Mm -hmm. And then there's um, and then I, I identified some some problems and some inconsistencies in that that other people have mentioned before, but I looked at it a little bit more closely. And then in a follow-up experimental paper, I actually tested some of these ideas and tried to come up with, um, look at which kinds of measures were most valid for measuring dream recall. And so um, so it's a little bit technical, so I'll, I'll just give you the brief uh, version first, and then if you want to ask more, sure. um, feel free. But but basically, there's, there's two main methods that researchers have been using to measure dream recall. And so one of them is called the retrospective method. And that involves basically asking someone about their dream recall in the past. So you would say to someone, you know, how, how often in the last few weeks did you recall your dreams? And then someone might say, you know, about once a week, about three times a week, once a month, something like that. And they'll give a single response that indicates their recall in, in the recent past. Mm -hmm. So that's the, that's the retrospective method. Um, but then you've also got the logbook method, which um, people actually record their dream each morning so it's more of a like uh, closer to being in real time rather than relying on your memory of the past. Right. And then you recall your dreams each morning for say a week, and then you can add it up at the end, and then you might see, oh, okay, I recalled dreams, you know, five times out of seven in the last week, and that's a measure of your dream recall. And within within those two categories, you know, you, you could either just, um, you know, there's there's lots of different variations as well. So with the logbook method, you might simply be looking at the number of dreams recalled, or you might be looking at dream content with the measure that I used, or you might even get someone to write out their dreams word for word and count the number of words or things like that. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. So lots of different approaches, but, but what I found is that, um, there's, there's usually a very high disparity between the retrospective rates and the logbook rates, even within the same person. So when you get someone to say, okay, how often did you remember your dreams in the last week? They might say two times in the last week, but then when you give them a logbook, It'll, it'll usually shoot up quite a lot. They might re recall four or five dreams out of seven for that. Um, and so then when you see this disparity, it raises the question of, okay, which measure is more valid? Is one of them underestimating the actual rate or is one of them actually increasing people's dream recall? Um, and this is an important thing to look at. Yeah, I mean, do you account for, I mean, it's kind of known 
um, and it's that's why it's always recommended to write a dream journal. Um, that that writing down your dreams regularly increases your dream recall over time. So is that taking that into account, or is that one of the things that that is basically being tried to lo- look at? Yeah, well, I wanted to look at that as well because that's um you know widely believed and people um, widely recommend that. But if you look at the the literature, you, you actually don't see a lot of strong evidence showing that that writing out your dreams improves your dream recall, um, which is very surprising to a lot of people. And you know, Yeah, that's surprising to me. Yeah, like, and basically I think it does um, improve your dream recall. But, but yeah, right. the evidence wasn't really very clear on that. So I just wanted to have a careful look and also look at different kinds of logbooks as well. Um, because, you know, as you know yourself, writing out your dreams can be a very time-consuming process. And if someone's, yeah, if, if, you know, I don't know about you, but it sometimes takes me a good hour or so to write out all of my dreams in the morning. I remember a lot. And it, it, it's funny that you say that for, for a couple of reasons. One, at, at the times where I do write down my dreams and at it, it, the, the best the best time a few years back when I, I did that really regularly, um, it got so long. I used to, I, I think I remembered up to like almost seven dreams or so. And, and full, rich dreams with full details. And I just couldn't, it would take more than an hour to even finish it if I tried. And I had to sort of sum up things and, and skip and so on. And so it got really ridiculous. Yeah. But the other thing that I've been, I've been begging people to, you know, I've, I've been reaching, reaching out to scientists and, and posting this uh, a long time ago that I wanted people to look at difference between you know, writing down their dreams, maybe telling a person, voice recording, um, especially a difference between writing, typing, and voice recording, because I am curious if there is something to writing, and people at least claim this, I don't know this to be true, um, but if there's something about writing, uh, handwriting, that helps memory. Uh, I think they, they, I've heard that being claimed at least even for studying for a test, like to in- increase the memory of something by writing down notes. Um, and I am really, really curious whether different methods of recording your dreams produces different results in increased, you know, dream recall. Well, this is exactly what I wanted to look at because if you're going to potentially be spending an hour of your time, um, you want to you want to know that that's actually helping, right? Um, if there's another way that saves you a lot of time. Um, and especially for people that are new to lucid dreaming, to ask someone to, you know, you've got to do these techniques and you've got to do this thing and then you've also got to write out your dreams for an hour every morning, that's a lot of work and that's going to be quite off-putting to a lot of people, especially someone that maybe isn't so much wanting to learn lucid dreaming per se, but they're more so wanting to um, use it as a way to treat, say, recurring nightmares or something as a treatment method. You want to try to make it as um, efficient as possible for people like that. Right. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, so basically what I found is um, it appears that writing out dreams word for word, at least in the study I conducted, didn't really improve dream recall over simply writing a short title and then rating how completely you remember the dream. Wow. Yeah, and so the key, the key thing here is though that um, you still need to spend that time trying to recall your dreams as completely as possible, um, and that's what the the dream quantity measure gets you to do. Because in order to rate how completely right. you remember it, you have to, you know, I tell people spend at least five ten minutes, think about your dreams, try to remember everything you can, and only when you're done recalling as much as you possibly can, then you provide your category rating for the dream. That is fascinating. That is absolutely fascinating because it would indicate, if this is true, it would indicate that really the ex, the, the thing that you need to do is just exercise your the muscle of memory. Like you just have to, you know, actively recall the details of the dream for the for getting the benefit of that. Wow. Yeah, I believe so. And writing things down, you know, as, as is widely known, this can help with memory and for um, sort of. Um, you know, like for taking tests and things like that, we write notes and that can be effective, but it's not the only method and it's not, um, you know, there's just ways to improve your memory without having to write things down word for word. You could do a voice recording, things like that. Um, I, th- I would say probably the only thing that you're going to miss out on if you don't write them down is um, you're not going to have this um, written record that you can then look over in the past. And, yeah. uh, you know, as you know, many people advocate studying your own dreams and you can find recurring Um, patterns and anomalies so you know let's say you always dream about swimming in the water you know if if you write your dreams down you might be able to identify something like that 
and then you can use that as a trigger for having lucid dreams. Exactly. So there are still there's still some benefits to writing out your dreams, but in terms of purely improving your dream recall, I don't think it's essential. I think you can do it with um, just sort of in your own mind, trying to recall as much as you can um, each morning. Yeah, yeah, that is that is interesting because I, I'm I've been. Uh, supporting the idea of writing down your dreams for a couple of reasons. And and this actually ties into why I wondered if it makes a difference whether you write it down by hand or type it. Um, you can even dictate it. So that will actually turn into text, but that's still not quite perfect technology. But the reason I think typing your dreams has an extra benefit, one, I think people should record them because they then they can go back and read them. It's useful for, you know, therapy and psychology reasons and just of interest in your own, you know, psyche and, and your own mind. But um, you can start finding little patterns uh, recurring dreams, little elements to use as triggers for reality checks. So you have, you start finding dream signs. If they repeat often in your dreams and in waking life, you start doing reality checks. When you see that dream sign, I at least believe, and this maybe is also something to be tested, um, I think that is more effective than just random throughout the day reality checks. Yeah. Um, because you have a you have an actual trigger that you train your mind to do a reality check when you see it, and since you do see it regularly in your dreams, that can serve as a great, um, great little trigger to do a reality check and then to trigger lucidity. But the the last part of it, and especially here, is where we get into um, the digital space, is that I think that we can somebody can write a a, a program or a, dream, a sophisticated dream journal that would sort of scan the words and find patterns that you might miss mm. and that had could have all sorts of you know interesting benefits um but that is something that i think could be valuable and i'm curious about i've always toyed with the idea of uh trying to write a dream journal uh like that but again t- typing typing your dreams is is uh, might be even harder for some people than than writing them down with a pen and paper. Yeah, that's right. Um that's a really fascinating idea and not something that I'd heard of or thought about before. I'm using technology to identify these patterns in your dreams that you don't otherwise notice. Um in terms of in terms of using different uh, sort of means to write out your dreams, I think um I think you're onto something with um there being a difference between typing and writing for example. And one of the things with that is, especially if you're waking up regularly during the night, and as some people who are, you know, especially disciplined, they write down their dreams every time they wake up and then go back to sleep. Um, if you're using a, a laptop for that, the um, the brightness from the screen could potentially cause an effect of increasing your alertness a little bit or making it harder to go back to sleep, right. or maybe even helping with lucid dreaming if it enhances your alertness. So there could be some kind of effect there that you'd want to be aware of. Yeah. And this is where maybe um, dictating might might come in handy. Maybe you can use an app to, you know, either record voice and or dictate your words. But I don't know if like also talking out loud, if you have a partner, that's harder or you you'll wake yourself up too much. If you're talking, it's really tricky. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Even um, even just if you are going to take that approach of writing down your dreams during the night, um, which I think is generally a good idea if you're willing to do so then um, even just taking a few notes. So, you know, had had the dream, walking over the bridge, doing this thing, etc. even just like a 20-second series of short brief notes, then that can be enough to re-trigger the memory of that in the morning. Definitely. And and it sounds like you're, you're, you know, what you found seems to support this. And this is great because I found sometimes that all I need is one thread from the dream, like one little piece to remember. And as soon as I pull on that thread, I can pull the rest of it out. Mm, yeah, exactly. Yeah, this is something I recommend to my participants. You know, when you first wake up in, at the end of the night, in the morning, um, even if you can't remember anything, just take take a little while and just try to think about, you know, what was I just doing or what was I just feeling or how do I feel now, like anything at all. And if you can, if you can get just the tiniest thread of some kind of specific content, 
you can then you know say oh i remember a bridge it's like, okay where was i on the bridge what happened before that oh, i walked up to the bridge and you can you can often remember a quite a long dream sequence and replay it in reverse by going back step by step yeah as long as you can get that initial thread i that's that's interesting i i wonder if you if you experience this same thing or if you have any just thoughts on it just in general i always found it odd that i recall my dreams in reverse and in fact in, if I only wake up in the morning and then the last thing I recall is the end of the last dream and then I write that down and then I remember the thing that happened before it and I write that down and it just, my memory starts going backwards in time mm. through through to the next dream and so on and so forth. It's always like, it, you know, I'm, I'm recalling it in reverse even though the story, once I remember the whole thing, obviously linearly it's easier to remember from beginning to end. I always found that odd. Yeah, well, I think um, the most likely explanation for that would be the way that memory um, consolidation works for dreaming. And basically, um, one of the most prominent theories of dream recall is called the arousal retrieval model. And the idea is that, um, you know, in order to remember your dreams, you generally have to have a period of awakening that occurs during or shortly after the dream and then you have to spend the time retrieving it and that transfers it into short uh, from short-term memory into long-term memory and the idea here is that we don't really um we usually don't rec record our dreams into our long-term memory they just kind of sit there in short term and then they quickly disappear if we don't recall them so when you're waking up um you're, you're most likely to remember the most like the, the later parts of a dream so you know the thing that you were just doing but then if you can hang on to that thread, then that can, through association, re-trigger those very tenuous memories that are already starting to fade. And then through the process of recalling it in reverse, then you kind of retrieve this whole story that you've experienced. Yeah. <laughs> very cool. So I, I'm curious if you have intuitions about if there, if there might be differences um, between um, writing down, typing, or, or just speaking, like voice recording. I think it's one of those things that's going to vary quite a lot depending on the person. If someone's um, if someone's a very light sleeper and they're at, at risk of getting too um, like too much awakened um, by typing or by a voice recording, then maybe just making some very brief notes in dim light in a book would be the best approach during the night. Whereas for someone else that's um, really easily falls back asleep, then you know why not go ahead and type out your dreams if it's not a problem for you. Um, yeah, it's going to be something that you got to experiment with on an individual basis. I think. Yeah, yeah, and 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 again, uh, learning all of this and talking to you about this makes me think about just the way I recommend for people a sort of tiered uh, system approach to practicing and and trying to induce lucid dreaming by you know starting simple um, and doing you know as little as they have to. Um, Again, to not get overwhelmed and then add stuff like start by writing down your dreams a little bit, then, you know, add, um, you know, reality checks then add this technique, then add this technique and so on and so forth, or according to their time and effort and, and ability um, to do so. So they can choose to sort of dive off the deep end if they feel like they're able to. I'm starting to think that we can apply that to to dream journaling in specific because of what you're telling me. So like a a sufficient sufficient minimum viable you know dream journal would be just writing a title and um, and then maybe mentally running through some of the content uh, and the sequence of the dream. A second sort of upgraded version, uh, and I'm thinking in my mind I'm sort of thinking the format of um, an, an app that I like, the Dream Journal uh, Dream Board, which is like maybe giving a, the dream a title or a, a very short description. And then they have a really cool way to input just specific things like colors you've seen in the dream, people you've seen in the dream, um, you know, places. And so just these kind of bite-sized, you know, category uh, type of elements without telling the whole story. And then for, you know, expert level, you have more time, you want to put and can put more time into it write down what happened in the dream. Yeah. Yeah, I think that sounds like a quite a sensible approach, especially for people that are going to, um, you know, vary in how motivated they are and how much time and effort they're willing to put in. Right. Very cool. Very cool stuff. So I'm going to let you go in a little bit, but I just wanted to ask, so you were just started saying about um, 
the next study you're doing. And I'm just curious sort of what's next and what else would you want to uh, to study and test with some theories that you have that you want to uh, put to the scientific method and um, what's what's ahead for you? Well, um, yeah, so the next thing I'm doing, um, so I'm sitting on this huge amount of data for this one study I've got. So um, over the next quite a few months, I expect I'll be looking at that and um, trying to reduce that down into a, a paper and try to get probably a couple of publications out of that. And that's going to shed some some more light on how to make the mild technique and the reality testing and the style technique more effective. Um, so that's going to be very exciting. Um, but at the same time, I'm also taking a new direction with this of, um, as I mentioned before, I'm going to be conducting a series of workshops across Australia. And I'm doing the next one in Adelaide in uh, the 27th of May, actually. And um, what I'm hoping through that is not only will I um, well, basically what I'm mostly hoping from it is this is going to give me a chance to work a little bit more hands-on with people and, and get a, a bit more of a deeper sense of how some of these techniques work and how to, how to teach it to people and adjust the techniques um, for specific individuals. And then that's going to inform my research and give me more ideas to further refine the techniques. So the two go hand in hand, you know, like teaching lucid dreaming on a personal level in workshops and then, um, translating that into the scientific research for testing theories and ideas. Yeah, I really like that approach. And I think working directly with people can inform how you formulate um, anywhere from the variations of the techniques themselves, uh, all the way to how do you um, instruct people to, to use them? How do you explain what they need to do, even in a scientific study uh, context? Yeah, exactly. Because um, you know, as you know, doing scientific research, it tends to be quite impersonal. Um, you know, you sort of minimize your contact with the participants because you don't want to bias the data. You don't want people, you know, trying to uh, sort of change their responses to please the researcher if they like you. So you basically have to right. minimize that content, which can make it a little bit of, um, yeah, a bit of a distant sort of process. Whereas doing a workshop, you're, you're right in there, you're working with the people and you're refining it on an individual basis. Um, so I'm very excited about pursuing that line uh, over the next few months. That's that's very cool. So um, so for people who want to uh, join or sign up for the workshops, or if people want to um, be on your your mailing list or join any sort of nationwide um, or worldwide rather um, studies or things that you might do in the future, where where should they go? Um, so for all of that, just go to my website, which is www.luciddreamingaustralia.com. Um, and you'll see any new studies are on there. Um, the workshops are on there. So I'm doing the next workshop on the 27th of May here in Adelaide, Australia. And then I'm getting people to register their interest for workshops in interstate as well. And um, if I get enough interest, I'll then be rolling it out in Melbourne, Sydney, Perth, et cetera, um, over the coming months. Um, and then also my e-newsletter, people can find out about the latest in lucid dreaming science through that as well. So, so yeah, it's all just on that website. Awesome. And then I'll put uh, all the links in the show notes as well. Beautiful. Well, uh, Denim, t thank you so much for joining me. This is all very exciting. I am delighted and really happy that you <laughs> you are out there doing this kind of work. So uh, thank you for all of that. Yes, thank you very much. It's been a real pleasure to talk to you today. All right. I hope you've enjoyed this episode. Um, check out all the show notes at lucidsage.com slash 3030. And if you've enjoyed this episode and this podcast and you would like to support it, you can go to lucidsage.com slash support. And that's it. Until next time, sweet and lucid dreams.